Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this October 2019 lecture on relatedness and narcissism in the American psyche by me, Dr. Ravi Chandra. For more information, go to ravichandramd.com or sflovedojo.org to find information about classes and upcoming uh, workshops on compassion and self-compassion. Thank you very much. And remember, compassion is how we do human. So, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the support over the eight weeks that uh, this lecture series has been going on. And tonight, I'm going to be pulling together some themes from the whole series uh, uh, on a, a little bit of Asian American issues, a little bit of uh, uh, compassion blended into it, and technology and psychology, uh, and, and above all, the big topic of the day, narcissism. We're, we're uh, in the global teach-in on narcissism. If you didn't know what it looks like, now you know what it looks like. Uh, not looking at me, but uh, hopefully, but uh, but just uh, you know, in our society, we have uh, just an overwhelming interest in narcissism. And there's one more talk on narcissism, which is which will be online. Uh, was delivered a couple, few, three weeks ago. So um, that'll be online. So that will be an introduction to this or a sequel to this. Um, but uh, yes, so, so this is my organization, the SF Love Dojo, uh, and I'm teaching uh, mindful self-compassion and compassion cultivation training workshops uh, and also this lecture series. And the compassion cultivation training will be happening in January to February of this year. And if you want details, you can look at my website, sflovedojo.org. So, um, so here's the Apple Watch, and uh, I have a, a story about one of my friends recently who, um, who uh, tragically, uh, his wife passed away, and he uh, he entered into it, gradually entered into a new relationship, and uh, his uh, new girlfriend gave him an Apple Watch, and uh, he was so excited about it when he saw me, and and he was excited about the girlfriend, but he was seemed to be really excited about the Apple Watch, and he he he, he said, "This helped me lose." Uh, 30 pounds and he detailed how it was helping him keep track of his steps and motivate him and so on and you know in the back of my head I said probably it would have been better to credit uh, the woman <laughs> rather than <laughs> the watch <laughs> speaking on a relational perspective since this is a talk about relatedness narcissism in the American psyche um, but here we are we're, we're in this uh, tug of war kind of with technology and human relationships, and um, uh, so I, I definitely side on the, you know, with my watch. I'm not wearing an Apple Watch. I definitely side uh, with relationships. And um, uh, I don't know if you know uh, this person, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, uh, but an Asian American activist passed away in 2015. And her famous question was, "What time is it on the clock of the world?" So that's, I think, something we should keep in mind. Where are we in space and time, and what should we be dealing with right now in our moment? Um, so let me play this clip. Um, it's from Boyhood, Richard Linkletter's Boyhood, where there's a really interesting conversation about technology. That sounds to me like just another extreme Mason view of everything. Not at all. I finally figured it out. It's like when they realized it was going to be too expensive to actually build cyborgs and robots. I mean, the costs of that were impossible. They decided to just let humans turn themselves into robots. That's what's going on right now. Oh, right now? Yeah, I mean, why not? There are billions of us just laying around, not really doing anything. We don't cost anything. and I mean, we're even pretty good at self-maintenance and reproducing constantly. And as it turns out, we're already biologically programmed for our little cyborg upgrades. How? I, seriously, I read this thing the other day about how, like, when you hear that ding on your inbox, you get a, like, a dopamine rush in your brain. It's like we're being chemically rewarded for allowing ourselves to be brainwashed. How evil is that? We're fucked. So you deleting your Facebook page is going to change all that? <laughs> Remember when Trevor deleted his Facebook page last year? And everyone just hated him? You made more fun of him than anyone. I still made fun of Trevor, though. <laughs> but it was like he was so pathetically desperate for attention. Or to be different or something. That's just because they did that lame story about it in the school paper. <laughs> and then he had to make a big announcement about it when he came back a month later. 
that's the thing though, I'm not doing it for attention. I just want to try and not live my life through a screen. I want like some kind of actual interaction. A real person, not just the profile they put up. Oh, I'm sorry, were you saying something? Yeah, okay, I know you're joking, <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of true. You have been, you know, checking your phone this whole time. And so what are you really doing? You don't care what your friends are up to on Saturday afternoon, but you're also obviously not fully experiencing my profound bitching. So yeah, it's like everyone's just stuck in like an in-between state, not really experiencing anything. It's not an experience, it's just information. Look, for example, I just got the address of the club where we're meeting them later, so we won't be wandering the streets of Austin Lost for an hour tonight. Thank you very much, Facebook. And I just texted my mom back. Oh, that's, that's groundbreaking. <laughs> she hasn't seen you in like 55 minutes. <laughs> oh, oh my God, most importantly, Maeve's family just got a miniature pet pig. <laughs> okay, you're right. That is, right? A, that is a really cute, tiny pig. Our, our lives can go on. They want one. All right, so um, this was a, a clip again from Richard Linklater's Boyhood. Uh, I highly recommend this film. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I've solved at least a couple of uh, captures in the last week, so I'm not a robot. I've proven I'm not a robot, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is uh, actually, that is kind of a delusion, psychiatrically speaking, that some people are coming up with, that, that they might be robots. And there was Ex Machina, which, uh, which had that delusion in it. Um, and there's also people who have the Truman Show delusion, which was a, a movie about being in a virtual reality. So technology is really, and there's always been, you know, uh, this, the classic story of the schizophrenic who thinks there's implants. So all of these technological delusions have kind of been with us for a long time. But uh, but this idea that uh, we're being turned into robots or being being uh, addicted basically uh, by our participation on social media, etc. I think that that part is true. The addiction part is definitely true. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, lit, uh, lit Quake fail. Now I love Lit Quake, uh, but uh, there was one panel which just got under my skin. Um, and uh, it was called AI Robots and the Future of Humans. And uh, the people who were speaking didn't really have a, seem to have a sense of what it meant to be human in the first place. Um, so, uh, you know, there were, uh, there, there was a guy who just wrote a book with 24 kind of science fiction-y short stories about uh, life in the future and we'll have memory bots and doctor bots and, and sex bots, of course, right? Because it's a guy. So, um, so, uh, so all of these things. And, 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 you know, one woman said, uh, uh, on the panel said, um, well, uh, I would definitely want a, uh, a robot to change my bedpan because I wouldn't want another human to be doing it. Now, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, kind of what she meant by that, whether she would be embarrassed to have another human do it or she thought it would be degrading to have another human do it. But, uh, but I always hearken back uh, to the Buddha's story about, uh, about uh, caring for other monks. So one, one monk was very sick. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the other monks were a little bit reluctant to take care of him, and he encouraged them to take care of each other. And because that's what we really find our humanity, I think, in caring for each other. So that was, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the, the delusions of Silicon Valley and uh, uh, how they take us away from this central aspect of caring for each other. But, but I actually, since I also do spoken word, I actually wrote a poem about this. So if you'll, just this morning, so if you'll bear with me, I can actually read it. So I'll put on my, my spoken word hat and uh, get, get into my right voice and uh, uh, you can respond appropriately like, like we're at a slam tournament or something. So, okay. Doc bot, mem bot, sex bot, soul bot, tinker, tailor, soldier, spy bot, Bots to tempt our every persuasion. Bots to take away indignation. Life will be a luxuriation. Total cessation of all frustration. We'll have life without the strife. Who's that bot? She's my wife. Just push that big red easy button. Tide pod trains. 
run while you think of nothing. Conducted by Siri, Alexa, and assistant, they'll tell you what is but not what isn't. Washbots ingest Tide Pod tsunamis. We're bots dreaming up Kool-Aid as a desk electric ship umami. I can hear VC scream, invest, invest. We invest without investigation. We don't invest, investigate what makes us tick. How can we make ourselves into, how we make ourselves into each other's heaven? We make errors of tick, not Han omission, thinking we're masters but commissioning our submission. We need a bot to break all robots, make us deal with our lifelong rut, make a society from our ruined civilization, from our robo ashes, polka dot, melting pot, Gordian knot, nutshell. Life without love is living in a little hell. Amairu um, is what rings our doorbell. That's my won't you be in my won't you be my neighbor gospel. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> all right. A lot of ideas. Amairu, um, Amairu um, is a Japanese term which uh, is about dependency. And uh, we all have dependency needs. And kind of outsourcing our dependency needs to robots is, I think it's, it's you know, it's all right to have assistance, but uh, how do we care for each other in the human realm? So that's, that's uh, kind of what my, my poem was trying to aim at. Um, so I, I think there are some foundational delusions of Silicon Valley, uh, predominantly white American culture, which feed, which feed into uh, white supremacy. And it's basically my needs as an individual comes first, and others exist or can be created in terms of bots to serve my needs or an app will serve my needs. And I think this is kind of a very retro futurism. And it's about how narcissistic power, control, autonomy, and uh, a narcissistic kind of independence, individuality, and identity is really uh, amplified by Silicon Valley culture. And it's all in response to insecurity about sickness, aging, death, powerlessness, you know, trying to become more powerful through our apps a lack of control that we all have as human beings, and that dependency. Oh, I don't want to be dependent on others, so I'll try to make myself independent in some way. But we know how well apps work and they fail, and so, so we, we all need each other in some way. And this is, I think, versus a more psychological, uh, psychologically minded interdependence, relationship, and compassion, which I think we really need to balance with, with the technological drives that are going forth. Um, and so Marshall McLuhan said, electric circuitry is orientalizing the West, the contained, the distinct, the separate. What he calls our Western legacy is being replaced by the flowing, the unified, the fused. And so, I mean, I mean maybe it's questionable, but, but the West is kind of about independence and individuality, particularly America. American individualism is uh, kind of run amok, especially in the last 50 years. Um, but, uh, but you can only understand the world, I think, through relationship, context, and interdependence. So the intersubjective is so important. Um, and uh, uh, peoples, histories, consciousnesses, and even objects are not, I think, contained, distinct, and separate. Uh, if you under know any kind of Buddhist philosophy, you know that everything is empty of inherent existence. So there's no individual existence. We're all interdependent. The table is made of atoms, and the atoms have particles, and you know all of these things. We're, we're very interdependent. We're not we're not distinct and unified and and uh, separate. Um, and the Korean concept of Jung is also about interconnection. Um, and so if we aren't overlapping, we are colliding. We emerge from the same source, the earth, uh, and now reacquainting ourselves with our source and with each other. So I think that's important to, it's like, you know, not, not taking us away from the earth, but how to get back to the earth and back into relationship with each other. Um, and so there's this book called American Theocracy. I'm just in the early stages of reading it, but, but it, it's really fascinating. Uh, it was a bestseller. Uh, empire is built on energy regimes. Um, and so the Dutch Empire was built on wind, water, and wood. That uh, to, uh, uh, transformed to the uh, coal uh, empire of the British. Uh, and then gradually that faded and oil took over. Um, and uh, so American empire is based on, has been based on oil, finance, and Christian fundamentalism is uh, this author's uh, thesis. And he, he worked for Nixon. And so he's a Republican strategist. 
Um, and, and so we can see, uh, you know, kind of from our, with our own eyes, how these three have really taken hold of part of our political spectrum and, and driven it in a particular way. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, away from relatedness. Um, and uh, so, um, so what's the energy, uh, oil is obviously fading, we've passed peak oil. Um, so what's the next energy empire that's going to uh, take place? And will that be wind, water, solar, renewables? Maybe, but actually it's, I think data is what's happening right now. Data, there's more money in data than there is in oil right now. Um, so, uh, so I think this is, is, is interesting because um, data and big tech do offer a kind of money, power, and control and a chance at better outcomes if it's used properly, right? Um, but I think it's also a siren call away from our human nature and an alluring distraction from what I think is our real energy source, um, which is uh, in relationship, you know, and in our minds and hearts and in our inner lives. I mean, I, I'm a, a more or less, you know, kind of ambiverted person. I get my energy from relationships, but also from my inner life. But I think really, you know, if we plumb our minds and our relationships, we really can, uh, that, that I think is a real source of, ener of energy, uh, you know, in, in a kind of a spiritual and a psychological sense. Um, yeah, so, um, so I think that's what I'm talking about, is our real power as human beings. Um, so I think, you know, to, uh, life involves suffering. Uh, we all have some kind of wound or disconnection in life, and that's the source of our suffering. Um, and I've already said that the Western legacy of contained, distinct, and separate existence is a delusion and a source of much suffering. Um, and if you think you're contained, distinct, and separate, you respond to your suffering in particular ways. Um, and I prefer to be compassionate about the ways people suffer uh, and not judge them for what some folks call vices. Um, but these are all rampant in our society. So, so from the suffering, we try to get some kind of survival and safety. Um, and this, this can lead to a very self-centered kind of uh, survival, ensuring up an insecure, threatened self. Um, and we do that with addictions, uh, for thrills and to escape distress. Uh, to, to try to survive in this uh, weird, deluded way. Uh, desire is often called a vice, but I think it's also a way to escape aloneness. Um, and uh, accumulation and greed, uh, excessive focus on work and productivity and consumerism and materialism, and that is also an attempt, I think, to provide safety and control and security, but it's also diluted and has a lot of negative effects. Uh, hatred, aversion, hostility. Uh, which, uh, which is attempt to keep oneself uh, safe from others or to overpower others. And it's also devaluing relationship and it, it's a cause of so much, uh, so much uh, problems. Um, and then also our undercurrent uh, in our competitive, individualistic, antagonistic society, jealousy, envy, social comparison, antagonism, and power struggle, right? I mean, these, all these things happen out of, I think, to, give, to be the most generous to those drives in our society, to, to provide some kind of safety and survival. But I think it's very misguided and delusional based on uh, separate existence, um, it, which is delusional. So um, just to explore antagonism a bit more, do any, does anybody know who the, these people are? Okay, those, yeah? You got it, yes, they, these are the Hatfields. Uh, a, a famous feuding uh, pair of families, the Hatfields and McCoys, uh, in the late 1800s in uh, Kentucky and uh, West Virginia. Um, so, you know, we don't really know how that started. Was, uh, they, most people, uh, I guess, suggest that one family was a Union family, the other family was a Confederate family, and, and that stirred up things during the Civil War, which lasted you know, 20 to 40 years afterwards. Um, other people say it was because somebody stole or killed somebody's hog. And you know, you know how these, this is not an uncommon story in human society, right? I mean, these kinds of feuds that happen. Um, so I think this idea of they done me wrong and I'm gonna get back at them, I'm gonna take revenge. I mean, that's a really common uh, uh, kind of sense uh, in society. And, and I think underneath that, I'm not happy and that's because it's someone else's fault. 
You know, we all, I think that that primal instinct of, you know, feeling unhappy and saying, oh, well, that's because they done me wrong, Doc, you know. And so I think we, you know, I think I, I've done that too. So, so we, we all can fall prey to that. Um, and uh, so, but now we can take a look at perhaps what happened. This was a, a scene from 2011, the White House uh, press correspondence dinner and Seth Meyers. And we can see what happens when somebody thinks they done me wrong. And then of course there's Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been saying that he will run for president as a Republican, which is surprising since I just assumed he was running as a joke. <laughs> Donald Trump often appears on Fox, which is ironic because a fox often appears on Donald Trump's head. If you're at the Washington Post table with Trump and you can't finish your entree, don't worry, the fox will eat it. And if I can for a moment talk about the birther issue, when did we get so suspicious about where people were born? A USA Today poll last week said 38% of Americans think the president was definitely born in the US. In the same poll, in the very same poll, only 5% more said Donald Trump was definitely born in the US. Has it reached the point where Americans only think something was ha someone was born here if they saw it? I know I was born here, and I know my younger brother was born here. But when it comes to my older brother, I can only take him at his word. Gary Busey said recently that Donald Trump would make a great president. Of course, he said the same thing about an old rusty birdcage he found. <laughs> Donald Trump owns the Miss USA pageant, which is great for Republicans because it will streamline their search for a vice president. <laughs> Donald Trump said recently he has a great relationship with the blacks, Though unless the blacks are a family of white people, I bet he's mistaken. <laughs> I like that Trump is filthy rich, but nobody told his accent. His whole life is models and gold leaf and marble columns, but he still sounds like a know-it-all down at the OTB. Mr. Trump may not be a good choice for president, but he would definitely make a great press secretary. How much fun would that be? Kim Jong-il is a loser. His latest rally was a flop. I feel bad for Ahmadinejad. He, he never man wears a windbreaker. He has no class. I, on the other hand, sell my own line of ties. You can find them at Macy's in the flammable section. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, what happens, what happens when you make fun of a Hatfield or McCoy? Well, um, so there was, there was more to come at that, uh, at that dinner. And this is, I think, where it got interesting for him. And then there's a vicious rumor floating around that I think could really hurt Mitt Romney. I heard he passed universal health care when he was governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> Someone should get to the bottom of that. And I know just the guy to do it. Donald Trump is here tonight. Now, I know that he's taken some flack lately. But no one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? <laughs> what really happened in Roswell? And where are Biggie and Tupac? <laughs> all kidding aside, obviously we all know about your credentials and breadth of experience. Um, for example, uh, no, seriously, just recently, in an episode of Celebrity Apprentice, at the steakhouse, 
The men's cooking team uh, did not impress the judges from Omaha Steaks. And there was a lot of blame to go around, but you, Mr. Trump, recognized that the real problem was a lack of leadership. And so ultimately, you didn't blame Little John or Meatloaf. <laughs> you fired Gary Busey. And these are the kind of decisions that would keep me up at night. Well handled, sir. Well handled. Say what you will about uh, Mr. Trump. He certainly would bring some change to the White House. Let's see what we've got up there. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that was actually the same weekend that uh, I believe that, uh, that, uh, uh, Obama, uh, kind of, uh, had the, well, Obama and the military, uh, did the raid that killed bin Laden. So, uh, and he had just released his birth certificate. So all these things happening and just now this weekend, uh, you know, uh, Trump has been making a lot of hay about uh, killing another leader. So I think that kind of competitiveness and antagonism, I think, also plays a role in decisions like this and the decision to turn the news cycle towards, you know, this is my bin Laden moment. I, I think that's, 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 that seems like what it's, uh, what's going on. But Adam Gopnik uh, at The New Yorker wrote, what was really memorable about this event, though, was Trump's response. Seated a few tables away from us, magazine scribes, Trump's humiliation was as absolute and as visible as any I have ever seen. His head set in place like a man in a pillory. He barely moved or altered his expression as wave after wave of laughter struck him. There was not a trace of feigning good humor about him, not an ounce of the normal politician or American regular guy's, hey, good one on me, attitude that thick-skinned cheerfulness that almost all American public people learn, however painfully, to cultivate. No head bobbing or hand clapping or chin shaking or sheepish grinning. He sat perfectly still, chin tight in locked, unmovable rage. If he had not just embarked on so ugly an exercise in pure racism in 2015, his ride down the escalator, one might have almost felt sorry for him. So, um, so yeah, so humiliation, shame, you know, driving that self-protective and antagonistic instinct. So, you know, I could actually feel some compassion for him. I mean, he's somebody who just doesn't deal well with being dissed in any way, you know. So, so that's, you know, I can imagine his inner life is quite uh, turbulent. Um, but uh, the TV show Blackish, I don't know if you ever, uh, any of you watch that, it's a great show, but it also dealt with the fallout of the 2016 election, and I think linked it to the broader, the bigger picture. Um, uh, Dre, the, uh, the main character, uh, uh, said in the episode, 11-9, uh, the day after the election, was a day that everyone felt what it was like to be a black person in America. And that really resonated with me. Um, and, uh, and we just marked 400 years since, uh, since 1619, the beginning of chattel slavery. So, so this is uh, obviously a, a historically uh, a difficult uh, moment, but here's, here's a little clip from Blackish. He's going to start arresting women for having abortions. He walks that back, and maybe you wouldn't have to worry about that if 650,000 emails didn't. No. Oh, 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 I'm talking about emails, not policy, emails. See what I did there? Look, all I know is that man would never be my president. Agree. 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 Right? Agree. 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 No, 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 hold on. What moment's so funny, Dre? Yeah, you have had nothing to say about any of this all day. Why do you not care about what's happening to our country? What did you say to me? Hmm? You don't think I care about this country? I love this country, even though at times it doesn't love me back. For my whole life, my parents, 
my grandparents, me, for most black people, this system has never worked for us. Seven feet. But we still play ball, trying to do our best to live by the rules, even though we knew they would never work out in our favor. Strange fruit. Had to live in neighborhoods that you wouldn't drive through. Send our kids to schools with books so beat up you couldn't read them. Work jobs that you wouldn't even consider in your nightmares. And blood at the roots. Black people wake up every day believing that our lives are gonna change even though everything around us says it's not. Truth be told, you ask most black people and they tell you that no matter who won this election, they didn't expect the hood to get better. Strange fruit. But they still voted because that's what you're supposed to do. You think I'm not sad that Hillary didn't win? That I'm not terrified about what Trump's about to do? I'm used to things not going my way. I'm sorry that you're not and it's blowing your mind. So excuse me if I get a little offended because I didn't see all of this outrage when everything was happening to all of my people since we were stuffed on boats in chains. I love this country as much, if not more, than you do, and don't you ever forget that. Wow, so uh, a really uh, big moment, and this was broadcast, I think, in January or February of 2017, so right when I think feelings were particularly difficult, and I think we're, we're all still carrying this, but, you know, America, has been that, uh, and I'll talk a bit about the ideals, but but that underbelly uh, of racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, uh, being about being a place that's really originally uh, about uh, white male property owners, uh, and how that's affected uh, the course of history, despite those stirring ideals. And this is a movie, The Voyage of the Damned, uh, and uh, it was about how a ship, the St. Louis was turned back from America. It was filled with about a thousand refugees uh, from Europe uh, and uh, uh, from uh, Germany primarily, I believe. And, uh, and it was turned back and, uh, uh, from America and eventually, I think some of the people were able to uh, stay uh, in the UK, but about two thirds of them were sent back to Europe and were later uh, uh, placed in, in the concentration camps and killed. So uh, this is a, a, another case where, uh, where America failed uh, people who were suffering. I mean, I think, you know, I think immediately of uh, the kids and, and uh, migrants at the border fleeing violence right now. So uh, this is an Ameri a, a, a tragically American story. Um, so I think you know, many of us uh, can relate to this voyage of the damned, the oppressed, the conquered, the vanquished, the downtrodden, the forgotten, the powerless, the lost, the marginalized. Uh, and we talked a few weeks ago about uh, Stanley Sue's ideas about uh, the Asian American as the marginalized man or, or person, woman, um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the hated, the dehumanized. And I think all of it feeds into a voyage of suffering in America and uh, a voyage of Han, where Han is the collective suffering or collective oppression shared by a people. So I think um, you know, all people who have suffered are linked uh, through the suffering to our common humanity. Um, and, uh, and I can always send you these slides if you'd like. So yeah, all right. Um, yeah, so again, just to, uh, again, the path of perpetuating suffering is, is being entangled in self-centered survival and uh, really being just out for oneself. And, and I think, again, all of these things uh, occur in parallel process. You know, we all, to some extent, are self-centered. Self-centeredness is a fundamental question of the human psyche. So we all engage with that. And trauma can, can pull us back into our defenses and activate this trauma cycle of mistrust, avoidance, reactivity, shame, blame, scapegoating, and so forth, trying to win antagonistically, take power over others, and, and, and splitting the world into good and bad and black and white. Um, but I think that occurs in parallel with a cultivation of relatedness and a more interdependent identity. So, um, so, uh, so that's, that's, I think, where we're at. Uh, we parallel process our suffering and trauma as we develop freedom from suffering. 
Um, and so uh, if I'm not happy, it must be my fault. You know, I'm to blame or someone else is to blame. Uh, someone's to blame. Uh, for me to be good, someone else has to be bad. And that's a, that's a typical uh, situation which we can encounter when we're mad at somebody. Well, if you, if you solidify that anger into hostility, someone has become your bad object. And every power structure has to have a bad object. And so you see uh, how American power structures make different groups bad or undesirable. Or un un unwanted, and, and I think it's something that filters down to our individual consciousnesses as well. And, and it's a it's a bad game to play. It's basically the Hatfields McCoys uh, in in our head. Um, and so I think you know we have to uh, uh, deal with that. And you know I think eventually it becomes like the scene from a John Woo film. Uh, it's like a it's like the standoff. It's like everybody's got the goods on someone else. Everybody's blaming somebody else, and we're just uh, we're just at it. You know. And we just, just wait till somebody has to shoot. But guess what? The other guy's got a gun too. You know, I mean, so, you know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of uh, 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 violence that's uh, in, our, in our national psyche right now. Um, okay. And so, uh, hearkening back to uh, our founding document, uh, the Declaration of Independence, um, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men, all people, are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, so, uh, so uh, equality and, and the autonomy, respect, and identity that's conferred by unalienable rights, the pursuit of happiness, the safety that's promised uh, by uh, uh, the right to, of life, uh, the freedom that's promised by liberty. Uh, these are all uh, political, philosophical, psychological, uh, spiritual, and moral ideals which have really revolutionized the world. Um, uh, we didn't quite invent them here. Some of them actually, some of our founding documents uh, really came from the Iroquois Federation. So, so this is a very interdependent uh, kind of creation and we forget about those origins and some, some ideas from, uh, uh, I guess, John Hume in Scotland and so forth. So, so really it's, it's out of this burgeoning of ideas and meeting of cultures that these ideals were formed. Um, but these ideals have obviously not be, well, have not been fulfilled. I mean, if America is to be true to its mission, I think we have to zealously uphold ourselves uh, to these principles in our civic and personal lives. And what might they mean to us today? Um, and implicit in this Declaration of Independence, I think, is a Declaration of Interdependence, because it's we hold these truths. We've decided, and e pluribus unum, uh, unum out of many, one. And, um, and, and obviously, if, I, if we have all these rights, then we all should you know, respect each other's rights as well and not impinge on them. So uh, impinge on our equality even. Um, and so I think it's a very important uh, founding principle to keep in mind. Um, and and uh, an artist that I, I recently uh, saw uh, had portrayed it this way. You see, uh, I don't know if you can see within the circle, there's uh, an equal sign, a barely perceptible equal sign, and it's tethered by these greater and less than signs. And this is Lisa Chun Rodandi who did this. Uh, she's an artist in Marin. Um, and uh, so, so it's the idea that, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, belief of equality, this, this feeling of equality, uh, kind of circulates with, uh, with uh, grandiosity and uh, feelings of uh, less being less than, um, but, but it's that spirit of equality which really provides peace and which, we can, which can really liberate us from these uh, up and down cycles of feeling greater and less than. So it's something uh, to uh, remember. And Rodandi said, my parents are survivors of war and violence. My primary hungry ghost, and that was the name of the exhibit, uh, that causes me great suffering and pain is really the sense of not belonging, not being connected. It pains me what's going on with this country. Uh, that's part of what inspired me to make this piece. So I, I also resonate with that. That idea of equality, I think, is so precious. Uh, and, and, uh, and I say, really, that, well, first, what's in the middle is actually, if you look at the painting, it's actually greater than what surrounds it. The common humanity is greater than everything else. And love, I think, is living in our equality, common humanity, and ordinariness as human beings. Um, so we love ourselves and love each other. 
Um, and uh, so Asian cultural and spiritual traditions show us other ways to deal with distress. And this is a clip from Jet Li's Fearless. And um, in this early clip, uh, Jet Li, uh, his, his character, Ho Jan, Ho Yang, Yang Zhou, oh, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing his last name, um, his father is fighting in a wushu duel. Um, and he's watching on the sidelines. So the kid you'll see uh, is, is, uh, grows up to be Jet Li. Yunjia,我们走吧。你又别再跟我说什么过家城。我发誓，霍元甲不会再允许任何人在这里打倒我。国威，你又跟谁打架了？ 书不好读老师在外面惹是生非来福伤得那么重要罚也不及这一时啊老爷来福带少爷回房生气了孩子武术最厉害的地方才能得到别人的敬重。练武练得好，谁敢不尊重？别人怕你，跟敬重你是两回事啊。来，赶快好好写啊，要不然爹又要打你了。嗯。So just to translate this scene for those listening on audio, uh, the key 
sequence is the grandmother telling the young Huo Yanjie that wushu is not just about winning and fighting, but it's about earning respect through kindness and uh, being good to other people and showing restraint. And that's how one attains honor uh, in society, uh, not by being feared. And this is a message that uh, Donald Trump apparently never got from his family. So I think this is uh, an important uh, sequence, which is uh, seen in many martial arts films, uh, that ha possibility of learning about the inner life and cultivating goodness and uh, relationship. <laughs> Well, so I know this is a movie, but Ho Yanjia uh, actually does grow up to be a great martial arts fighter in the early 1900s. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, you can, this is another way of dealing with distress and, and really trying to understand what it is that creates a uh, relationship uh, between people, uh, Confucian principles like Jen, uh, which is goodness, and Ren, uh, benevolence, uh, really uh, are in uh, Asian society. So it's something that we bring in, you know, actually this is great that, that uh, there was a woman in uh, this young guy's life and he has to go through this lesson like a couple more times when he's older too. So he doesn't quite get it uh, for a while. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, there's another woman later on who really comes in and, and takes, you know, kind of bends his ways a little bit uh, too by caring for him and he kind of rediscovering that quality of caring. Um, but uh, but that uh, that idea, I mean, that, that this uh, idea of uh, uh, res uh, getting respect by giving uh, kindness to others, uh, that's a message that apparently uh, the president did not get a as a young person. Apparently, according to reports and documentaries, his mother was very cold and detached, uh, and uh, his father told him he had to be a killer in life, um, and uh, he had to win at all costs against others. So. That uh, kind of Hatfield-McCoy instinct uh, has uh, really uh, been ingrained in, in him. And uh, uh, you know, if only he'd watched a few more movies maybe or gotten that message um, or somebody had just told him no, you know. Um, so, but, but I think that's something that Asian cultural and spiritual traditions have to offer the West as well, is that depth of an inner life uh, and understanding the humanity of other people. Um, not to say that it's exclusively Asian, but I think it's, it, 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 you know, certainly I'm Asian, so I, I respond to that. Um, but, uh, but there are political candidates who are speaking to that core common humanity. Here's a quote from Elizabeth Warren. Vulnerability underlies everything we care about. We put so much effort into being strong and independent, which is actually a delusion, but at heart, we're all just working to keep it together. So, I mean, this is not an endorsement or anything, but I think this resonates with that sense of common humanity, which is so needed right now. So I, I view this kind of statement as really medicine for, for the American psyche. Um, and here's another little clip uh, with uh, Killer Mike and Bernie Sanders. In America, um, there will be blood, the movie that we live that movie, that you can be rich. Well, rich is a long life with your children. My grandparents were never rich, right? They raised three successful homeowners. We have never had to go back to them and ask them. That's rich. Rich is being able to spend the time with your family. Rich is not an endless pursuit of money. And I'm a rapper, right? I got a chain around. Hey, you know what? I've been trying to say that for several years. <laughs> And this guy just did it a lot better than I did. Absolutely. I mean, what we are taking on, it's not just Trump and his policies. It's what he thinks human life is about. And what he thinks human life is, you rob, you steal, you cheat, you step on people. Ah, then you make a billion dollars. That's his understanding of what success is in life. And you're talking about a very, very different success. You're right. You love your kids. You have a decent home. You have a decent community. We don't have to step over people who are sleeping on the sidewalk. Our kids got a good education. I'm willing, like Cardi, to do my part. I would just like to see the money that's placed here, funding things like our military industrial complex, our private prison complex. I'd like to see that fund pre-K programs as early as two years old so that children are readers going into kindergarten. I want to see us be the country that we truly can be, that we've never have been, but truly can be. Now, I am really pissed off. I got to tell you why. Because you're saying all of this stuff better than I say it. 
That's what I try to say. That's exactly, that's, you got the whole thing. Well, you have inspired me. All right, good. What you're talking about, what do we mean by wealth? Is wealth just having a billion dollars in the bank? And living in a society where you can't breathe the air, where the climate change is gonna destroy the planet, is that really wealth? I mean, the Bible tells us something very differently, right? The great thinkers of our time, Dr. King and others tell us something very different. We are, and this is what I do say all the time, we're the wealthiest country in the history of the world. All of the issues you're talking about, can we have high quality pre-K? Yes, absolutely. Your point is that kids are not gonna make it by the time they get into the first grade, they're already two years behind. They can't read, right? Can we address this issue? Yeah, I think we can. Send the guy to the moon, I think we can do that. All right, all right. So uh, another great uh, video uh, showcasing kind of common humanity and principles. Um, and Andrew Yang is uh, to uh, humanity first, another uh, candidate. So a lot of candidates talking, I think, about good values and, and you can decide for yourselves who has the plans and the uh, expertise, et cetera, to, uh, to, to make those things happen. Um, so, uh, so we, and, and here's my favorite. I don't know if you all saw this documentary. I saw this three times and uh, you know, I, tears poured down every time I watched it. Uh, won't you be my neighbor? And there's, I guess, Tom Hanks' film is just coming out soon, if it's not out already. Um, and a little kindness makes a world of difference. And uh, uh, I, there's, uh, this is great. I love America. I do love America. This is in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. They uh, dressed up a horse like Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my neighbor? And so uh, I think we should just ship that horse to, uh, to Capitol Hill and call it the Mitch McConnell's Kentucky Compromise. Here he is, he's wearing a red sweater. So <laughs> maybe he's channeling Mr. Rogers in some weird way and uh, we can get this all to work. But uh, right now, I don't know if he, uh, if he knows whether he's, or which, which side of the horse he is, <laughs> the front end or the back end. So <laughs> we'll, we'll kind of sort that out. Um, uh, so, um, but you know, uh, I, I also, one of my favorite movies is Juan Antonio Bayona's uh, the Impossible. So I don't know if you saw that about the 2004 tsunami. Uh, this is uh, based on a true story of a Spanish family that was trapped in Thailand. So this, this early scenes especially of this are, are kind of difficult, but I think it also gets us down to the core of who, uh, who we can be as human beings if we really cultivate our sense of connection and caring. And what I think is, you know, what the Buddhists call all, uh, Buddha nature, but it's altruism. It's that sense of just wanting to do something for someone else uh, immediately, almost without thinking. But I think we have to also cultivate that quality of caring and giving and generosity and, and uh, to, for our own survival. Uh, I think the survival of what's most important to us as social beings is our connection to others. So we'll watch this clip. We have to get to safety. No, we have to help that boy. Um, if another wave catches us down here, we will die. We have to climb that tree right now. Come on. Where are you? Mom, look at you! We need help! We cannot risk it. We can't risk it, Mom. Come on. Listen. What if that boy, the Simon, were Thomas? What if they needed help? You'd want someone to help them, wouldn't you? Simon and Thomas are dead!
What's your name? I'm Lucas. What's your name? Daniel. Okay, Daniel. Okay, come on. You'll be okay. We're gonna get you out, okay? Left him. It's all right. It's all right. So we as human beings do better in crisis situations, about in disaster situations, of caring for each other. In the uh, 1980 Loma Prieta, 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, this certainly happened. Uh, it happens in disasters, but kind of sustaining that spirit of caring is uh, harder to do. And we expect civil society to help us help each other not to uh, simply, uh, uh, you know, kind of help ourselves to, to profit, etc. I mean, so there's that quality of our, our interconnection um, and recognizing the urgency of now and our human potential of caring is another way to deal with our distress, that we are needed to help each other uh, in some way. Um, and so this is from Dr. Keltner's The Power Paradox. And, he, he writes about how with increasing power, there's a loss of empathy. And I think also that some people seek power because they don't have empathy in the first place. And they think the way to be loved is to be admired or feared, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, uh, and so but, but enduring power, he says, uh, comes from a focus on others. Enduring power comes from empathy. Enduring power comes from giving. Enduring power comes from expressing gratitude, and enduring power comes from telling stories that unite. So um, I highly recommend this book, and also his book, uh, Born to be Good. Uh, and, and I think that, that really uh, tells us more about that human power, that our individual power and our communal power, not data, it's, it's relationship and the mind and heart uh, as we connect to each other. Um, so, again, finally, just to go back, we, we've dealt with equality and the vulnerability of our common humanity that are, are present uh, in our founding documents. Um, but what is the pursuit of happiness? What, what do you think is happiness? Uh, does anyone have any ideas? Um, I've already primed you, but, uh, but uh, what do you think is happiness? <clears throat> Relationships, yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationships, certainly. That's that's actually uh, from research. Happiness is love from the Grant study, uh, the longest running longitudinal study of men. Um, yeah, happiness is love, relation, the warmth of relationships. Anybody else? I mean, some people say meeting goals. So sure, that brings happiness and satisfaction. Uh, but it's really kind of, I think, rewiring our brains to appreciate what's really here uh, in our moment and dealing with what's here. And I think that real happiness and lasting happiness comes from an increasing capacity to deal with distress and difficult emotions. That's kind of the bedrock of, of real happiness. Um, and so I think cultivating the inner life to deal with distress uh, brings us lasting happiness, both you know, individually and, and communally. Um, because we, we all suffer and we're all essentially powerless uh, in life and vulnerable. And uh, we all face the forces of nature. Right now, uh, you know, so many people displaced by fire. We're, we're powerless in the, in the face of that. And, and we're also powerless in the, force, in, in the face of forces of our own nature. So I think, you know, we, we, human nature, we can improve if we collaborate with each other and understand what it is that brings happiness to us and others. And uh, the Dalai Lama says, if you wish to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. So I think this, these are the themes that are age old uh, in human society and which I think we can return to if we're just reminded of them. Um, so, uh, so, Thank you, this is again, this is my organization, SF Love Dojo. I'll be offering a compassion cultivation training workshop series uh, in January to February, open to the community, sliding scale, pay what you can, mindful self-compassion uh, sometime in the next year as well, and hopefully I'll get a chance to do more lectures. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but uh, that's it for tonight. All right. Thank you very much.
Any questions, anybody? Or? Question just about, yes. you know, talking about suffering, you know, think of the Buddhist, you know, the Four Noble Truths mm -hmm. of Buddhism. Do you see a lot of different, like, because one of the points you had there was about the Christian, white Christian. Right, oh, right. That first, forget that first slide. Right, right. Power. Uh, the, the author Kevin Phillips uh, pointed out uh, yeah. oil, uh, uh, finance, and Christian, you know, radical religion, as he calls it, uh, or Christian fundamentalism, as the the three three uh, kind of tripod <clears throat> legs of uh, American empire. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, how do people seek happiness in, in different spiritual traditions? I mean, there may be some resonances because we're all human, but, but I think, you know, one thing that, uh, that people say is that, uh, and this is not necessarily a good thing, is that often Asians accept suffering as, oh, it's just life. You know, shigata ga nai, as the Japanese says, this is, it can't be helped. Um, so kind of an acceptance of suffering. Um, so, I mean, I think the good part about the Western tradition is overcoming material suffering. And so, so they say, you know, to, to be generous, the Western tradition has uh, uh, amplified um, uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 material wealth, um, but a spiritual poverty. And the East historically has had uh, spiritual wealth, but material poverty. Um, so, so there's differences, but also you know, there are things about uh, dealing with difficult emotions, uh, which is coming now uh, to the West through uh, Buddhism, mindfulness, uh, uh, mindful self-compassion, and so forth. Um, uh, it's just a different way of actually looking at distress rather than the blame cycles. Uh, also, I think shame has been pointed uh, out as a factor in addiction uh, in, in, uh, in, in the Midwest and so forth because people who have, get addicted feel shame. Uh, typically Christians, they, they don't want to you know, s tell their problems to other people for fear of being judged. So I think that's another problem, this idea that you're fundamentally bad as a human being and in the Western tradition, your you know, original sin fallen and all of that. And so you're already a bad object to begin with. And, um, and you know, any shame, well, others are gonna judge you too and say that there's something morally wrong with you. And the moral model does not work for addiction treatment uh, or really anything, I think, uh, for dealing with any kind of distress. It's, it's really about understanding one's own difficult emotions and, and distress. And so in the, in the uh, you know, Buddhist tradition, uh, the Buddha's last words were, uh, be a lamp unto yourself. You know, understand your own suffering and uh, you know, strive on diligently. You know? So it's up to us as individuals to understand our own personal suffering and also use whatever tools we can. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so I think people definitely, you know, there are plenty of Christians who use Christianity to relieve suffering and be charitable. That's another, you know, big uh, difference between uh, Eastern and Western traditions. There's more charitability uh, uh, traditionally. Um, but that's also built on uh, a couple millennia of building empire and having wealth to be generous with. So, I mean, you know, so there's, there's a mixed bag there. So, and there, there are virtues in each tradition, you know, that, that you know, are, are important. But, you know, for, my, for myself personally, I find the mindful self-compassion, compassion cultivation really, in a secular way, uh, bring out those, those basic uh, qualities of being human. Um, uh, yeah. We don't really get a lot of instruction on self-compassion <clears throat> in either tradition, right? Eastern or Western well, um, yeah, I, I don't know about classic Buddhism because I'm not really trained as an expert in that. But, uh, but I think what comes from Buddhism is the loving kindness, certainly compassion, meditation, and so forth. Um, but, uh, but I think you know, in a way, uh, the self-compassion is kind of built into uh, Eastern culture historically. And so, you know, the Dalai Lama, when he was told there are a lot of people who hate themselves. In the West, he was just like, well, "What does that mean?" You know, he just, you know, that it was so. The concept was so foreign. How could you hate yourself? But um, because I think in the East, the the tradition of relatedness is there, so you get, generally speaking, a lot more attention and care. And so 
you, you kind of know it's not about you. You don't blame yourself. And here people tend to blame themselves because there's this kind of spiritual tradition of, you know, a saying that some people are bad and, you know, sin and all of that, right? And you have to be redeemed in a particular way. And, you know, that's a spiritual idea, but psychologically it, it can be very uh, difficult uh, to deal with. I mean, there are some advantages, but, but also people who have disadvantages. So, you know, we just, you know, I, as a psychiatrist, of course, I have to see what helps the person and what needs to be added. And I certainly think that the mindful self-compassion and compassion cultivation can work with any spiritual tradition uh, and, and, you know, just offer these things. And, you know, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But I think in general, you know, calling all those ways that we suffer, that multicolored slide that I had, um, you know, I think they're, they're in both, in many traditions, they're called vices in some way, but I think, I think it's really, you know, you can understand them as, as survival and safety instincts kind of run amok. You know, I think that's a more compassionate way to look at them. Uh, people trying to be human, uh, trying to survive, and, and it causes problems. And so, so we need more of a rebalancing, I think, of interdependence and relationship to balance out the individualism and hopefully get a get a real you know good meeting <clears throat> yeah. yeah so all right yeah. thank you very much appreciate your staying all the way through <laughs>